This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ian Bartholomew. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Four, Part Five. In the mind of James there was a great conflict. We should do him injustice if we supposed that a state of vassalage was agreeable to his temper. He loved authority and business. He had a high sense of his own personal dignity. Nay, he was not altogether destitute of a sentiment which bore some affinity to patriotism. It galled his soul to think that the kingdom which he ruled was of far less account in the world than many states which possessed smaller natural advantages. And he listened eagerly to foreign ministers when they urged him to assert the dignity of his rank, and to place himself at the head of a great confederacy, to become the protector of injured nations, and to tame the pride of that power which held the continent in awe. Such exhortations made his heart swell with emotions unknown to his careless and effeminate brother. But those emotions were soon subdued by a stronger feeling. A vigorous foreign policy necessarily implied a conciliatory domestic policy. It was impossible at once to confront the might of France and to trample on the liberties of England. The executive government could undertake nothing great without the support of the commons, and could obtain their support only by acting in conformity with their opinion. Thus James found that the two things which he most desired could not be enjoyed together. His second wish was to be feared and respected abroad. But his first wish was to be absolute master at home. Between the incompatible objects on which his heart was set, he for a time went irresolutely to and fro. A conflict in his own breast gave to his public acts a strange appearance of indecision and insincerity. Those who, without the clue, attempted to explore the maze of his politics, were unable to understand how the same man could be, in the same week, so haughty and so mean. Even Louis was perplexed by the vagaries of an ally who passed, in a few hours, from homage to defiance, and from defiance to homage. Yet now that the whole conduct of James is before us, this inconsistency seems to admit of a simple explanation. At the moment of his accession, he was in doubt whether the kingdom would peaceably submit to his authority. The exclusionists, lately so powerful, might rise in arms against him. He might be in great need of French money and French troops. He was therefore, during some days, content to be a sycophant and a mendicant. He humbly apologized for daring to call his parliament together without the consent of the French government. He begged hard for a French subsidy. He wept with joy over the French bills of exchange. He sent to Versailles a special embassy charged with assurances of his gratitude, attachment, and submission. But scarcely had the embassy departed when his feelings underwent a change. He had been everywhere proclaimed without one riot, without one seditious outcry. From all corners of the island he received intelligence that his subjects were tranquil and obedient. His spirits rose. The degrading relation in which he stood to a foreign power seemed intolerable. He became proud, punctilious, boastful, quarrelsome. He held such high language about the dignity of his crown and the balance of power that his whole court fully expected a complete revolution in the foreign politics of the realm. He commanded Churchill to send home a minute report on the ceremonial of Versailles in order that the honours which the English embassy was received there might be repaid, and not more than repaid, to the representative of France at Whitehall. The news of this change was received with delight at Madrid, Vienna, and The Hague. Louis was at first merely diverted. My good ally talks big, he said, but he is as fond of my pistoles as ever his brother was. Soon, however, the altered demeanour of James, and the hopes with which that demeanour inspired both the branches of the House of Austria, began to call for more serious notice. A remarkable letter is still extant, in which the French king intimated a strong suspicion that he had been duped, and that the very money which he had sent to Westminster would be employed against him. 
By this time England had recovered from the sadness and anxiety caused by the death of the good-natured Charles. The Tories were loud in professions of attachment to their new master. The hatred of the Whigs was kept down by fear. That great mass which is not steadily Whig or Tory, but which inclines alternately to Whiggism and to Toryism, was still on the Tory side. The reaction which had followed the dissolution of the Oxford Parliament had not yet spent its force. The King early put the loyalty of his Protestant friends to the proof. While he was a subject, he had been in the habit of hearing Mass with closed doors in a small oratory which had been fitted up for his wife. He now ordered the doors to be thrown open, in order that all who came to pay their duty to him might see the ceremony. When the host was elevated, there was a strange confusion in the antechamber. The Roman Catholics fell on their knees. The Protestants hurried out of the room. Soon a new pulpit was erected in the palace, and during Lent a series of sermons was preached there by popish divines, to the great discomposure of zealous churchmen. A more serious innovation followed. Passion Week came, and the king determined to hear Mass with the same pomp with which his predecessors had been surrounded when they repaired to the temples of the established religion. He announced his intention to the three members of the interior cabinet, and requested them to attend him. Sunderland, to whom all religions were the same, readily consented. Godolphin, as Chamberlain of the Queen, had already been in the habit of giving her his hand when she repaired to her oratory, and felt no scruple about bowing himself officially in the house of Rimmon. But Rochester was greatly disturbed. His influence in the country arose chiefly from the opinion entertained by the clergy and by the Tory gentry, that he was a zealous and uncompromising friend of the Church. His orthodoxy had been considered as fully atoning for faults, which would otherwise have made him the most unpopular man in the kingdom, for boundless arrogance, for extreme violence of temper, and for manners almost brutal. He feared that, by complying with the royal wishes, he should greatly lower himself in the estimation of his party. After some altercation, he obtained permission to pass the holidays out of town. All the other great civil dignitaries were ordered to be at their posts on Easter Sunday. The rites of the Church of Rome were once more, after an interval of a hundred and twenty-seven years, performed at Westminster with regal splendour. The guards were drawn out. The Knights of the Garter wore their collars. The Duke of Somerset, second in rank among the temporal nobles of the realm, carried the sword of state. A long train of great lords accompanied the king to his seat but it was remarked that Ormond and Halifax remained in the antechamber. A few years before, they had gallantly defended the cause of James against some of those who now pressed past them. Ormond had borne no share in the slaughter of Roman Catholics. Halifax had courageously pronounced Stafford not guilty. As the time-servers who had pretended to shudder at the thought of a popish king, and who had shed without pity the innocent blood of a popish peer, now elbowed each other to get near a popish altar, the accomplished trimmer might, with some justice, indulge his solitary pride in that unpopular nickname. Within a week after this ceremony, James made a far greater sacrifice of his own religious prejudices than he had yet called on any of his Protestant subjects to make. He was crowned on the 23rd of April, the feast of the patron saint of the realm. The abbey and the hall were splendidly decorated. The presence of the queen and of the peeresses gave to the solemnity a charm that had been wanting to the magnificent inauguration of the late king. Yet those who remembered that inauguration pronounced that there was a great falling off. The ancient usage was that, before a coronation, the sovereign, with all his heralds, judges, counsellors, lords, and great dignitaries, should ride in state from the Tower of Westminster. Of these cavalcades, the last and the most glorious was that which passed through the capital, while the feelings excited by the restoration were still in full vigour. Arches of triumph overhung the road. All Cornhill, Cheapside, St. Paul's Churchyard, Fleet Street, and the Strand were lined with scaffolding. The whole city had thus been admitted to gaze on royalty in the most splendid and solemn form that royalty could wear. James ordered an estimate to be made of the cost of such a procession, 
and found that it would amount to about half as much as he proposed to expend in covering his wife with trinkets. He accordingly determined to be profuse where he ought to have been frugal, and niggardly where he might pardonably have been profuse. More than a hundred thousand pounds were laid out in dressing the Queen, and the procession from the tower was omitted. The folly of this course is obvious. If pageantry be of any use in politics, it is of use as a means of striking the imagination of the multitude. It is surely the height of absurdity to shut out the populace from a show of which the main object is to make an impression on the populace. James would have shown a more judicious munificence and a more judicious parsimony if he had traversed London from east to west with the accustomed pomp, and had ordered the robes of his wife to be somewhat less thickly set with pearls and diamonds. His example was, however, long followed by his successors, and sums, which well employed, would have afforded exquisite gratification to a large part of the nation, were squandered on an exhibition to which only three or four thousand privileged persons were admitted. At length the old practice was partially revived. On the day of the coronation of Queen Victoria, there was a procession in which many deficiencies might be noted, but which was seen with interest and delight by half a million of her subjects, and which undoubtedly gave far greater pleasure, and called forth far greater enthusiasm, than the more costly display which was witnessed by a select circle within the abbey. James had ordered Sancroft to abridge the ritual. The reason publicly assigned was that the day was too short for all that was to be done. But whoever examines the changes which were made will see that the real object was to remove some things highly offensive to the religious feelings of a zealous Roman Catholic. The communion service was not read. The ceremony of presenting the sovereign with a richly bound copy of the English Bible, and of exhorting him to prize above all earthly treasures a volume which he had been taught to regard as adulterated with false doctrine, was omitted. What remained, however, after all this curtailment, might well have raised scruples in the mind of a man who sincerely believed the Church of England to be a heretical society, within the pale of which salvation was not to be found. The king made an oblation on the altar. He appeared to join in the petitions of the litany, which was chanted by the bishops. He received from those false prophets an unction typical of a divine influence, and knelt with a semblance of devotion, while they called down upon him that holy spirit of which they were, in his estimation, the malignant and obdurate foes. Such are the inconsistencies of human nature that this man, who from a fanatical zeal for his religion threw away three kingdoms, yet chose to commit what was little short of an act of apostasy, rather than forego the childish pleasure of being invested with the gewgaws symbolic of kingly power. Francis Turner, Bishop of Ely, preached. He was one of those writers who still affected the obsolete style of Archbishop Williams and Bishop Andrews. The sermon was made up of quaint conceits, such as seventy years earlier might have been admired, but such as moved the scorn of a generation accustomed to the purer eloquence of Spratt, of South, and of Tillotson. Solomon was King James. Adonia was Monmouth. Joab was a Rye House conspirator, Shimei a Whig libeller, Abiathar an honest but misguided old cavalier. One phrase in the Book of Chronicles was construed to mean that the king was above the Parliament, and another was cited to prove that he alone ought to command the militia. Towards the close of the discourse, the orator very timidly alluded to the new and embarrassing position in which the church stood with reference to the sovereign and reminded his hearers that the Emperor Constantius Chlorus, though not himself a Christian, had held in honour those Christians who had remained true to their religion, and had treated with scorn those who sought to earn his favour by apostasy. The service in the abbey was followed by a stately banquet in the hall, the banquet by brilliant fireworks, and the fireworks by much bad poetry. End of Part 5
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James II by Thomas Babington Macaulay Book 1, Chapter 4, Part 6 This may be fixed upon as the moment at which the enthusiasm of the Tory party reached the zenith. Ever since the accession of the new king, addresses had been pouring in which expressed profound veneration for his person and office, and bitter detestation of the vanquished Whigs. The magistrates of Middlesex thanked God for having confounded the designs of these regicides and exclusionists, who, not content with having murdered one blessed monarch, were bent on destroying the foundations of monarchy. The city of Gloucester execrated the bloodthirsty villains who had tried to deprive his majesty of his just inheritance. The burgesses of Wigan assured their sovereign that they would defend him against all plotting Achitophels and rebellious Absaloms. The grand jury of Suffolk expressed a hope that the Parliament would proscribe all the exclusionists. Many corporations pledged themselves never to return to the House of Commons any person who had voted for taking away the birthright of James. Even the capital was profoundly obsequious. The lawyers and the traders vied with each other in civility. Inns of court and inns of chancery sent up fervent professions of attachment and submission. All the great commercial societies, the East India Company, the African Company, the Turkey Company, the Muscovy Company, the Hudson's Bay Company, the Maryland Merchants, the Jamaica Merchants, the Merchant Adventurers, declared that they most cheerfully complied with the royal edict, which required them still to pay custom. Bristol, the second city of the island, echoed the voice of London, but nowhere was the spirit of loyalty stronger than in the two universities. Oxford declared that she would never swerve from those religious principles which bound her to obey the king without any restrictions or limitations. Cambridge condemned, in severe terms, the violence and treachery of those turbulent men who had maliciously endeavoured to turn the stream of succession out of the ancient channel. Such addresses as these filled, during a considerable time, every number of the London Gazette. But it was not only by addressing that the Tories showed their zeal. The writs for the new Parliament had gone forth, and the country was agitated by the tumult of a general election. No election had ever taken place under circumstances so favourable to the court. Hundreds of thousands, whom the Popish plot had scared into Whiggism, had been scared back by the Rye House plot into Toryism. In the counties, the government could depend on an overwhelming majority of the gentlemen of three hundred a year and upwards, and on the clergy almost to a man. Those boroughs, which had once been the citadels of Whiggism, had recently been deprived of their charters by legal sentence, or had prevented the sentence by voluntary surrender. They had now been reconstituted in such a manner that they were certain to return members devoted to the crown. Where the townsmen could not be trusted, the freedom had been bestowed on the neighbouring squires. In some of the small western corporations, the constituent bodies were in great part composed of captains and lieutenants of the guards. The returning officers were almost everywhere in the interest of the court. In every shire, the Lord Lieutenant and his deputies formed a powerful, active, and vigilant committee for the purpose of cajoling and intimidating the freeholders. The people were solemnly warned, the people were solemnly warned from thousands of pulpits not to vote for any Whig candidate as they should answer it to him who had ordained the powers that be, and who had pronounced rebellion a sin not less deadly than witchcraft. All these advantages the predominant party, not only used to the utmost, but abused in so shameless a manner that grave and reflecting men, who had been true to the monarchy in peril, and who bore no love to republicans and schismatics, stood aghast and augured from such beginnings the approach of evil times. Yet the Whigs, though suffering the just punishment of their errors, though defeated, disheartened, and disorganized, 
did not yield without an effort. They were still numerous among the traders and artisans of the town, and among the yeomanry and peasantry of the open country. In some districts, in Dorsetshire, for example, and in Somersetshire, they were the great majority of the population. In the remodelled boroughs they could do nothing, but in every county where they had a chance they struggled desperately. In Bedfordshire, which had lately been represented by the virtuous and unfortunate Russell, they were victorious on the show of hands, but were beaten at the poll. In Essex they polled 1,300 votes to 1,800. At the election for Northamptonshire, the common people were so violent in their hostility to the court candidate that a body of troops was drawn out in the marketplace of the county town and was ordered to load with ball. The history of the contest for Buckinghamshire is still more remarkable. The Whig candidate, Thomas Wharton, eldest son of Philip Lord Wharton, was a man distinguished alike by dexterity and by audacity, and destined to play a conspicuous were not always respectable part in the politics of several reigns. He had been one of those members of the House of Commons who had carried up the exclusion bill to the bar of the Lords. The court was therefore bent on throwing him out by fair or foul means. The Lord Chief Justice Jeffreys himself came down into Buckinghamshire for the purpose of assisting a gentleman named Hackett who stood on the high Tory interest. A stratagem was devised which, it was thought, could not fail of success. It was given out that the polling would take place at Aylesbury, and Wharton, whose skill in all the arts of electioneering was unrivalled, made his arrangements on that supposition. At a moment's warning, the sheriff adjourned the poll to Newport Pagnell. Wharton and his friends hurried thither, and found that Hackett, who was in the secret, had already secured every inn and lodging. The Whig freeholders were compelled to tie their horses to the hedges, and to sleep under the open sky in the meadows which surround the little town. It was with the greatest difficulty that refreshments could be procured at short notice for so large a number of men and beasts. Though Wharton, who was utterly regardless of money, when his ambition and party spirit were roused, dispersed fifteen hundred pounds in one day, an immense outlay for those times. Injustice seems, however, to have animated the courage of the stout-hearted yeoman of Buckinghamshire, the son of a constituent of John Hamden. Not only was Wharton at the head of the poll, but he was able to spare his second votes to a man of moderate opinions, and to throw out the Chief Justice's candidate. In Cheshire, the contest lasted six days. The Whigs polled about 1,700 votes, the Tories about 2,000. The common people were vehement on the Whig side, raised the cry of down with the bishops, insulted the clergy in the streets of Chester, knocked down one gentleman of the Tory party, broke the windows and beat the constables. The militia was called out to quell the riot, and was kept assembled in order to protect the festivities of the conquerors. When the poll closed, a salute to five great guns from the castle proclaimed the triumph of the church and the crown to the surrounding country. The bells rang. The newly elected members went in state to the city cross, accompanied by a band of music and by a long train of knights and squires. The procession, as it marched, sang Joy to Great Caesar, a loyal ode, which had lately been written by Durfey, and which, though like all Durfey's writings, utterly contemptible, was at that time almost as popular as Lillibulero became a few years later. Round the cross, the train bands were drawn up in order, a bonfire was lighted, the exclusion bill was burned, and the health of King James was drunk with loud acclamations. The following day was Sunday. In the morning, the militia lined the streets leading to the cathedral. The two knights of the shire were escorted with great pomp to their choir by the magistracy of the city, heard the dean preach a sermon, probably on the duty of passive obedience, and were afterwards feasted by the mayor. End of part six. LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ian Bartholomew.
The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Four, Part Seven. In Northumberland, the triumph of Sir John Fenwick, a courtier whose name afterwards obtained a melancholy celebrity, was attended by circumstances which excited interest in London, and which were thought not unworthy of being mentioned in the dispatches of foreign ministers. Newcastle was lighted up with great piles of coal. The steeple sent forth a joyous peal. A copy of the exclusion bill, and a black box, resembling that which, according to the popular fable, contained the contract between Charles the Second and Lucy Walters, were publicly committed to the flames, with loud acclamation. The general result of the elections exceeded the most sanguine expectations of the court. James found with delight that it would be unnecessary for him to expend a farthing in buying votes. He said that, with the exception of about forty members, the House of Commons was just such as he should himself have named. And this House of Commons it was in his power, as the law then stood, to keep to the end of his reign. Secure of parliamentary support, he might now indulge in the luxury of revenge. His nature was not placable, and while still a subject, he had suffered some injuries and indignities which might move even a placable nature to fierce and lasting resentment. One set of men in particular had, with a baseness and cruelty beyond all example and all description, attacked his honour and his life, the witnesses of the plot. He may well be excused for hating them, since even to this day the mention of their names excites the disgust and horror of all sects and parties. Some of these wretches were already beyond the reach of human justice. Bedloe had died in his wickedness, without one sign of remorse or shame. Dugdale had followed, driven mad, men said, by the furies of an evil conscience, and with loud shrieks imploring those who stood round his bed to take away Lord Stafford. Carstairs, too, was gone. His end had been all horror and despair, and with his last breath he had told his attendants to throw him into a ditch like a dog, for that he was not fit to sleep in a Christian burial-ground. But Oates and Dangerfield were still within the reach of the stern prince whom they had wronged. James, a short time before his accession, had instituted a civil suit against Oates for defamatory words, and a jury had given damages to the enormous amount of a hundred thousand pounds. The defendant had been taken in execution, and was laying in prison as a debtor, without hope of release. Two bills of indictment against him for perjury had been found by the grand jury of Middlesex, a few weeks before the death of Charles. Soon after the close of the elections, the trial came on. Among the upper and middle classes, Oates had few friends left. The most respectable Whigs were now convinced that, even if his narrative had some foundation in fact, he had erected on that foundation a vast superstructure of romance. A considerable number of low fanatics, however, still regarded him as a public benefactor. These people well knew that, if he were convicted, his sentence would be one of extreme severity, and were therefore indefatigable in their endeavours to manage an escape. Though he was as yet in confinement only for debt, he was put into irons by the authorities of the King's Bench Prison, and even so he was with difficulty kept in safe custody. The mastiff that guarded his door was poisoned, and on the very night preceding the trial a ladder of ropes was introduced into the cell. On the day in which Titus was brought to the bar, Westminster Hall was crowded with spectators, among whom were many Roman Catholics, eager to see the misery and humiliation of their persecutor. A few years earlier his short neck, his legs uneven, the vulgar said, as those of a badger, his forehead low as that of a baboon, his purple cheeks, and his monstrous length of chin had been familiar to all who frequented the courts of law. He had then been an idol of the nation. Wherever he had appeared, men had uncovered their heads to him. The lives and estates of the magnates of the realm had been at his mercy. Times had now changed, and many who had formerly regarded him as the deliverer of his country, shuddered at the sight of those hideous features on which villainy seemed to be written by the hand of God. It was proved beyond all possibility of doubt that this man had by false testimony deliberately murdered several guiltless persons, 
he called in vain on the most eminent members of the parliament which had rewarded and extolled him to give evidence in his favour some of those whom he had summoned absented themselves none of them said anything tending to his vindication one of them the earl of huntingdon bitterly reproached him with having deceived the houses and drawn on them the guilt of shedding innocent blood the judges browbeat and reviled the prisoner with an intemperance which even in the most atrocious cases ill becomes the judicial character he betrayed however no sign of fear or of shame and faced the storm of invective which burst upon him from the bar bench and witness-box with the insolence of despair he was convicted on both indictments his offence though in a moral light murder of the most aggravated kind was in the eye of the law merely a misdemeanour the tribunal however was desirous to make his punishment more severe than that of felons or traitors and not merely to put him to death but to put him to death by frightful torments he was sentenced to be stripped of his clerical habit to be pilloried in palace yard to be led round westminster hall with an inscription declaring his infamy over his head to be pilloried again in front of the royal exchange to be whipped from Aldgate to Newgate, and after an interval of two days to be whipped from Newgate to Tyburn. If against all probability he should happen to survive this horrible infliction, he was to be kept close prisoner during life. Five times every year he was to be brought forth from his dungeon and exposed on the pillory in different parts of the capital. This rigorous sentence was rigorously executed. On the day on which Oates was pilloried in Palace Yard, he was mercilessly pelted, and ran some risk of being pulled to pieces. But in the city his partisans mustered in great force, raised a riot, and upset the pillory. They were, however, unable to rescue their favourite. It was supposed that he would try to escape the horrible doom which awaited him by swallowing poison. All that he ate and drank was therefore carefully inspected. On the following morning he was brought forth to undergo his first flogging. At an early hour, an innumerable multitude filled all the streets from Aldgate to the Old Bailey. The hangman laid on the lash with such unusual severity as showed that he had received special instructions. The blood ran down in rivulets. For a time the criminal showed a strange constancy, but at last his stubborn fortitude gave way. His bellowings were frightful to hear. He swooned several times, but the scourge still continued to descend. When he was unbound, it seemed that he had borne as much as a human frame can bear without dissolution. James was entreated to remit the second flogging. His answer was short and clear. He shall go through with it if he has breath in his body. An attempt was made to obtain the Queen's intercession, but she indignantly refused to say a word in favour of such a wretch. After an interval of only forty-eight hours, Oates was again brought out of his dungeon. He was unable to stand and it was necessary to drag him to Tyburn on a sledge. He seemed quite insensible, and the Tories reported that he had stupefied himself with strong drink. A person who counted the stripes on the second day said that they were seventeen hundred. The bad man escaped with life, but so narrowly that his ignorant and bigoted admirers thought his recovery miraculous, and appealed to it as proof of his innocence. The doors of the prison closed upon him. During many months, he remained ironed in the darkest hole of Newgate. It was said that in his cell he gave himself up to melancholy, and sate whole days uttering deep groans, his arms folded and his hat pulled over his eyes. It was not in England alone that these events excited strong interest. Millions of Roman Catholics, who knew nothing of our institutions or of our factions, had heard that a persecution of singular barbarity had raged in our island against the professors of the true faith, that many pious men had suffered martyrdom, and that Titus Oates had been the chief murderer. There was, therefore, great joy in distant countries when it was known that the divine justice had overtaken him. Engravings of him, looking out from the pillory, and writhing at the cart's tail, were circulated all over Europe. And epigrammists, in many languages, made merry with the doctoral titles which he pretended to have received from the University of Salamanca, and remarked that, since his forehead could not be made to blush, it was but reasonable that his back should do so. Horrible as were the sufferings of Oates, 
they did not equal his crimes. The old law of England, which had been suffered to become obsolete, treated the false witness, who had caused death by means of perjury, as a murderer. This was wise and righteous, for such a witness is, in truth, the worst of murderers. To the guilt of shedding innocent blood, he had added the guilt of violating the most solemn engagement into which man can enter with his fellow men, and of making institutions, to which it is desirable that the public should look with respect and confidence, instruments of frightful wrong and objects of general distrust. The pain produced by ordinary murder bears no proportion to the pain produced by murder of which the courts of justice are made the agents. The mere extinction of life is a very small part of what makes an execution horrible. The prolonged mental agony of the sufferer, the shame and misery of all connected with him, the stain abiding even to the third and fourth generation, are things far more dreadful than death itself. In general it may be safely affirmed that the father of a large family would rather be bereaved of all his children by accident or by disease than lose one of them by the hands of the hangman. Murder by false testimony is therefore the most aggravated species of murder, and Oates had been guilty of many such murders. Nevertheless, the punishment which was inflicted upon him cannot be justified. In sentencing him to be stripped of his ecclesiastical habit and imprisoned for life, the judges exceeded their legal power. They were undoubtedly competent to inflict whipping, nor had the law assigned a limit to the number of stripes. But the spirit of the law clearly was that no misdemeanour should be punished more severely than the most atrocious felonies. The worst felon could only be hanged. The judges, as they believed, sentenced Oates to be scourged to death. That the law was defective is not a sufficient excuse, for defective laws should be altered by the legislature, and not strained by the tribunals, and least of all should the law be strained for the purposes of inflicting torture and destroying life. That Oates was a bad man is not a sufficient excuse, for the guilty are almost always the first to suffer those hardships which are afterwards used as precedents against the innocent. Thus it was in the present case. Merciless flogging soon became an ordinary punishment for political misdemeanours of no very aggravated kind. Men were sentenced, for words spoken against the government, to pains so excruciating that they, with unfeigned earnestness, begged to be brought to trial on capital charges and sent to the gallows. Happily, the progress of this great evil was speedily stopped by the revolution, and by that article of the Bill of Rights which condemns all cruel and unusual punishments. End of Part 7 LibriVox Recording All LibriVox Recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ian Bartholomew. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Four, Part Eight. The villainy of Dangerfield had not, like that of Oates, destroyed many innocent victims. For Dangerfield had not taken up the trade of a witness till the plot had been blown upon and till juries had become incredulous. He was brought to trial, not for perjury, but for the less heinous offence of libel. He had, during the agitation caused by the exclusion bill, put forth a narrative containing some false and odious imputations on the late and on the present king. For this publication he was now, after the lapse of five years, suddenly taken up, brought before the Privy Council, committed, tried, convicted, and sentenced to be whipped from Oldgate to Newgate, and from Newgate to Tyburn. The wretched man behaved with great effrontery during the trial, but, when he heard his doom, he went into agonies of despair, gave himself up for dead, and chose a text for his funeral sermon. His forebodings were just. He was not, indeed, scourged quite so severely as Oates had been, but he had not Oates's iron strength of body and mind. After the execution, Dangerfield was put into a hackney coach and was taken back to prison. As he passed the corner of Hatton Garden, a Tory gentleman of Gray's Inn, named Francis, stopped the carriage and cried out with brutal levity, "'Well, friend, have you had your heat this morning?' The bleeding prisoner, maddened by his insult, answered with a curse. Francis instantly struck him in the face with a cane, 
which injured the eye. Dangerfield was carried dying into Newgate. This dastardly outrage roused the indignation of the bystanders. They seized Francis, and were with difficulty restrained from tearing him to pieces. The appearance of Dangerfield's body, which had been frightfully lacerated by the whip, inclined many to believe that his death was chiefly, if not wholly, caused by the stripes which he had received. The government and the Chief Justice thought it convenient to lay the whole blame on Francis, who, though he seems to have been at worst guilty of aggravated manslaughter, was tried and executed for murder. His dying speech is one of the most curious moments of that age. The savage spirit which had brought him to the gallows remained with him to the last. Boasts of his loyalty and abuse of the Whigs were mingled with the parting ejaculations in which he commended his soul to the divine mercy. An idle rumour had been circulated that his wife was in love with Dangerfield, who was eminently handsome and renowned for gallantry. The fatal blow, it was said, had been prompted by jealousy. The dying husband, with an earnestness, half ridiculous, half pathetic, vindicated the lady's character. She was, he said, a virtuous woman. She came of a loyal stock, and, if she had been inclined to break her marriage vow, would at least have selected a Tory and a churchman for her paramour. About the same time a culprit, who bore very little resemblance to Oates or Dangerfield, appeared on the floor of the court of King's Bench. No eminent chief of a party has ever passed through many years of civil and religious dissension with more innocence than Richard Baxter. He belonged to the mildest and most temperate section of the Puritan body. He was a young man when the Civil War broke out. He thought that the right was on the side of the houses, and he had no scruple about acting as chaplain to a regiment in the parliamentary army. But his clear and somewhat sceptical understanding, and his strong sense of justice, preserved him from all excesses. He exerted himself to check the fanatical violence of the soldiery. He condemned the proceedings of the High Court of Justice. In the days of the Commonwealth he had the boldness to express, on many occasions, and once even in Cromwell's presence, love and reverence for the ancient institutions of the country. While the royal family was in exile, Baxter's life was chiefly passed at Kidderminster in the assiduous discharge of parochial duties. He heartily concurred in the restoration and was sincerely desirous to bring about an union between Episcopalians and Presbyterians. For with a liberty rare in his time, he considered questions of ecclesiastical policy as of small account when compared with the great principles of Christianity, and had never, even when prelacy was most odious to the ruling powers, joined in the outcry against bishops. The attempt to reconcile the contending factions failed. Baxter cast in his lot with his proscribed friends, refused the mitre of Hereford, quitted the parsonage of Kidderminster, and gave himself up almost wholly to study. His theological writings, though too moderate to be pleasing to the bigots of any party, had an immense reputation. Zealous churchmen called him a roundhead, and many nonconformists accused him of Erastianism or Arminianism. But the integrity of his heart, the purity of his life, and the vigour of his faculties, and the extent of his attainments were acknowledged by the best and wisest men of every persuasion. His political opinions, in spite of the oppression which he and his brethren suffered, were moderate. He was friendly to that small party which was hated by both Whigs and Tories. He could not, he said, join in cursing the trimmers, when he remembered who it was that had blessed the peacemakers. In a commentary on the New Testament he had complained, with some bitterness, of the persecution which the dissenters suffered, that men who, for not using the prayer-book, had been driven from their homes, stripped of their property, and locked up in dungeons, should dare to utter a murmur, was then thought a high crime against the state and the church. Roger Lestrange, the champion of the government, and the oracle of the clergy, sounded the note of war in the observator. An information was filed. Baxter begged that he might be allowed some time to prepare for his defence. It was on the day on which Oates was pilloried in Palace Yard that the illustrious chief of the Puritans, oppressed by age and infirmities, came to Westminster Hall to make this request. Jeffreys burst into a storm of rage. "'Not a minute!' he cried. "'To save his life, I can deal with saints as well as with sinners.' There stands Oates on one side of the pillory, 
and if Baxter stood on the other, the two greatest rogues in the kingdom would stand together. When the trial came on to Guildhall, a crowd of those who loved and honoured Baxter filled the court. At his side stood Dr. William Bates, one of the most eminent of the nonconformist divines. Two Whig barristers of great note, Polexfen and Wallop, appeared for the defendant. Polexfen had scarcely begun his address to the jury, when the Chief Justice broke forth. Polexfen, I know you well. I will set a mark on you. You are the patron of the faction. This is an old rogue, a schismatical knave, a hypocritical villain. He hates the liturgy. He would have nothing but long-winded cant without book. And then his lordship turned up his eyes, clasped his hands, and began to sing through his nose, in imitation of what he supposed to be Baxter's style of praying. Lord, we are thy people, thy peculiar people, thy dear people. Polexfen gently reminded the court that his late majesty had thought Baxter deserving of a bishopric. And what ailed the old blockhead then, cried Jeffreys, that he did not take it? His fury now rose almost to madness. He called Baxter a dog, and swore that it would be no more than justice to whip such a villain through the whole city. Wallop interposed, but fared no better than his leader. "'You are in all these dirty causes, Mr. Wallop,' said the judge. "'Gentlemen of the long robe ought to be ashamed to assist such a factious knave.' The advocate made another attempt to obtain a hearing, but to no purpose. "'If you do not know your duty,' said Jeffreys, "'I will teach it you.' Wallop sat down, and Baxter himself attempted to put in a word. But the Chief Justice drowned all expostulation in a torrent of ribaldry and invective, mingled with scraps of hoodibras. "'My lord,' said the old man, "'I have been much blamed by dissenters for speaking respectfully of bishops.' "'Baxter for bishops!' cried the judge. "'That's a merry conceit, indeed. "'I know what you mean by bishops, rascals like yourself, "'Kidderminster bishops, factious, snivelling Presbyterians.' "'Again Baxter essayed to speak, and again Jeffreys bellowed. "'Richard, Richard, do you think we will let you poison the court? "'Richard, thou art an old knave. "'Thou hast written books enough to load a cart.' and every book as full of sedition as an egg is full of meat. By the grace of God, I'll look after thee. I see a great many of your brotherhood waiting to know what will befall their mighty don. And there, he continued, fixing his savage eyes on Bates, there is a doctor of the party at your elbow. But by the grace of God Almighty, I will crush you all. Baxter held his peace. But one of the junior counsel for the defence made a last effort, and undertook to show that the words of which complaint was made would not bear the construction put on them by the information. With this view he began to read the context. In a moment he was roared down. You shan't turn the court into a conventicle. The noise of weeping was heard from some of those who surrounded Baxter. Snivelling calves, said the judge. Witness to character were in attendance and among them were several clergymen of the established church. But the Chief Justice would hear nothing. "'Does your lordship think,' said Baxter, "'that any jury will convict a man on such a trial as this?' "'I warrant you, Mr. Baxter,' said Jeffreys, "'don't trouble yourself about that.' Jeffreys was right. The sheriffs were the tools of the government. The jurymen, selected by the sheriffs from among the fiercest zealots of the Tory party, conferred for a moment— and returned a verdict of guilty. My lord, said Baxter, as he left the court, there was once a chief justice who would have treated me very differently. He alluded to his learned and virtuous friend, Sir Matthew Hale. There is not an honest man in England, answered Jeffreys, but looks on thee as a knave. The sentence was, for those times, a lenient one. What passed in conference among the judges cannot be certainly known. It was believed among the nonconformists, and is highly probable, that the Chief Justice was overruled by his three brethren. He proposed, it is said, that Baxter should be whipped through London at the cart's tail. The majority thought that an eminent divine, who, a quarter of a century before, had been offered a mitre, and who was now in his seventieth year, would be sufficiently punished for a few sharp words by fine and imprisonment. The manner in which Baxter was treated by a judge, 
who was a member of the cabinet and a favourite of the sovereign, indicated, in a manner not to be mistaken, the feeling with which the government at this time regarded the Protestant nonconformists. But already that feeling had been indicated by still stronger and more terrible signs. The Parliament of Scotland had met. James had purposely hastened the session of this body, and had postponed the session of the English houses, in the hope that the example set at Edinburgh would produce a good effect at Westminster. For the legislature of this northern kingdom was as obsequious as those provincial estates which Louis the Fourteenth still suffered to play at some of their ancient functions in Brittany and Burgundy. None but an Episcopalian could sit in the Scottish Parliament, or could even vote for a member, and in Scotland an Episcopalian was always a Tory or a time-server, and even the assembly thus constituted could pass no law which had not been previously approved by a committee of courtiers. All that the government asked was readily granted. In a financial point of view, indeed, the liberality of the Scottish estates was of little consequence. They gave, however, what their scanty means permitted. They annexed in perpetuity to the crown the duties which had been granted to the late king, and which, in his time, had been estimated at forty thousand pounds sterling a year. They also settled on James for life an additional annual income of two hundred and sixteen thousand pounds Scots, equivalent to eighteen thousand pounds sterling. The whole sum which they were able to bestow was about sixty thousand a year, little more than what was poured into the English exchequer every fortnight. Having little money to give, the estates supplied the defect by loyal professions and barbarous statutes. The king, in a letter which was read to them at the opening of their session, called on them in vehement language to provide new penal laws against refractory Presbyterians, and expressed his regret that business made it impossible for him to propose such laws in person from the throne. His commands were obeyed. A statute framed by his ministers was promptly passed, a statute which stands forth even among the statutes of that unhappy country at that unhappy period, pre-eminent in atrocity. It was enacted, in few but emphatic words, that whoever should preach a conventicle under a roof, or should attend, either as preacher or as hearer, a conventicle in the open air, should be punished with death and confiscation of property. This law, passed at the king's instance, by an assembly devoted to his will, deserves a special notice. For he has been frequently represented by ignorant writers as a prince rash, indeed, and injudicious in his choice of means, but intent on one of the noblest ends which a ruler can pursue, the establishment of entire religious liberty. Nor can it be denied that some portions of his life, when detached from the rest and superficially considered, seem to warrant this favourable view of his character. While a subject he had been, during many years, a persecuted man, and persecution had produced its usual effect on him, his mind, dull and narrow as it was, had profited under that sharp discipline. While he was excluded from the court, from the admiralty, and from the council, he was in danger of being also excluded from the throne, only because he could not help believing in transubstantiation and in the authority of the See of Rome. He made such rapid progress in the doctrines of toleration that he left Milton and Locke behind. What he often said could be more unjust than to visit speculations with penalties which ought to be reserved for acts. What more impolitic than to reject the services of good soldiers, seamen, lawyers, diplomatists, financiers, because they hold unsound opinions about the number of the sacraments or the pluripresence of the saints? He learned by rote those commonplaces which all sects repeat so fluently when they are enduring oppression, and forget so easily when they are able to retaliate it. Indeed, he rehearsed his lessons so well that those who chanced to hear him on this subject gave him credit for much more sense and much readier education than he really possessed. His professions imposed on some charitable persons, and perhaps imposed on himself, but his zeal for the rights of conscience ended with the predominance of the Whig party. When fortune changed, when he was no longer afraid that others would persecute him, when he had it in his power to persecute others, his real propensities began to show themselves. 
he hated the puritan six with a manifold hatred theological and political hereditary and personal he regarded them as the foes of heaven and as the foes of all legitimate authority in church and state as his great-grandmother's foes and his grandfather's his father's and his mother's his brother's and his own he who had complained so fondly of the laws against papists now declared himself unable to conceive how men could have the impudence to impose the repeal of the laws against puritans he whose favourite theme had been the injustice of requiring civil functionaries to take religious tests established in scotland when he resided there as viceroy the most rigorous religious tests that had ever been known in the empire he who had expressed just indignation when priests of his own faith were hanged and quartered amused himself with hearing covenanters shrieks and see them writhe while their knees were beaten flat in the boots in this mood he became king and he immediately demanded and obtained from the obsequious estates of scotland as the surest pledge of their loyalty the most sanguinary law that has ever in our island been enacted against protestant nonconformists with this the whole spirit of his administration was in perfect harmony the fiery persecution which had raged when he ruled scotland as vice-regent waxed hotter than ever from the day on which he became sovereign those shires in which the covenanters were most numerous were given up to the license of the army with the army was mingled a militia composed of the most violent and profligate of those who called themselves episcopalians preeminent among the bands which oppressed and wasted these unhappy districts were the dragoons commanded by john graham of claverhouse the story ran that these wicked men used in their revels to play at the torments of hell and to call each other by the names of devils and damned souls the chief of this Toffet, a soldier of distinguished courage and professional skill but rapacious and profane of violent temper and of obdurate heart has left a name which wherever the scottish race is settled on the face of the globe is mentioned with a peculiar energy of hatred to recapitulate all the crimes by which this man and men like him goaded the peasantry of the western lowlands into madness would be an endless task a few instances must suffice and all those instances shall be taken from the history of a single fortnight that very fortnight in which the scottish parliament at the urgent request of james enacted a new law of unprecedented severity against dissenters end of part eight